I've had one of those weeks where I felt today that I haven't prepared as much as I wanted to today. Ever have one of those three weeks? Yeah. So I just want to say a prayer a second, just that God will still speak through my weakness and his word will be heard today. Lord, here I am. You've known this message that, of faith that um, I've tried to prepare. I pray that in my own lack of preparing today, that your message still will be heard by your grace. So lead and guide us as a congregation as we want to hear your words in our lives today. Amen. Starting this new series here on Romans, and today we're focusing on the Reformation slogans. And one of their key slogans is that we are saved by faith alone. So I've, bear with me a little bit. I decided to come up with a new way to end the church's money problems forever. <laughs> I know many feel that churches look for money, but offer few benefits in return. But I promise my way has eternal promises. By bringing your church some of your hard-earned cash, I will give you this piece of paper that says the following. This church promises your name here, you eternal life. If you give a significant amount of money, over $10,000, the pastor himself will write your name on the bottom <laughs> line. If you give over $100,000, the church will hire a professional calligrapher to sign your name on the line. If you give over a million dollars, we will include engraving your name in the pulpit. <laughs> now, the church needs money to keep going. And by giving your money, you get the promise of eternal life. I mean, that's a fair trade, isn't it? You don't want your church to fail, do you? You know, this country is being flooded with many Islamic immigrants. And if your church fails, it'll probably be turned into a mosque. We can't let that happen. We don't want to have a mosque on every corner in this country. They want to take over. Don't you know that? My proposal is a mutually beneficial system. You get the promise of eternal life, and your church gets to continue sustaining this beautiful building. Lie, Shannon. I don't have the power to determine who has eternal life or not. You might think it is outrageous that I thought of such an idea. But that was the case when Martin Luther sought to reform the church. The Roman Catholic Church at that time was trying to raise money for the Grand St. Peter's Basilica. In order to raise money for the construction, the church was selling what they called indulgences. If you gave money to the church, then you received a piece of paper that promised you a loved one will spend less time in purgatory. Purgatory was a between state between heaven and earth, where someone who died went in order to get righteous enough to live in heaven. The Catholic Church was also at that time facing a major threat from Islam in Eastern Europe and wanted to raise money to fight back Islam. Real needs for the church and yet, yet not the message of eternal life proclaimed in Romans, where eternal life, from Paul's perspective, is the gift of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, if that idea about solving the church's money problems won't work. How about another idea? I call it the Good Deeds Management Program. <laughs> for a monthly fee, your church will keep a chart for you monitoring all your good deeds. Your chart, this chart has different categories. See, church attendance, money to help those in need, service time, prayer and Bible study, Standing up for the rights of victims, 
and support your church and in parentheses their pastor. <laughs> As you complete something on the chart and let the church office know, we'll put a check in one of your boxes. Hopefully, by life's end, you'll have earned enough check boxes for God to grant you eternal life. There's a, this is one of our elders here. One of their charts kind of filled out a little bit. They're doing pretty good at church attendance, but prayer and Bible study is a little lacking right now. So we'll, they'll have to work on that to get their chart filled up. You will have earned it by being such a good person that if anybody doubts your goodness, you can have them call the church and we will show them your chart of goodness. And just for a small monthly fee. This chart idea, as well as prevalent during the time of Martin Luther, the Roman Catholic Church at that time had these letters of indulgences. People could purchase letters of indulgences, which were written pieces of paper saying they earned forgiveness by giving money or supporting the church's mission in some way. Luther, as he read Romans and other scriptures, scriptures saw salvation or eternal life as a gift from God by our faith alone. Faith in what Jesus did for us, not faith in our own good deeds. Problem with both of my previous examples is the question, can we ever give enough money or be good enough to earn eternal life. Are God's standards of goodness the same as our Canadian values? Living by our own standards puts all the pressure on our own shoulders to perform by carrying salvation as if hoping we did enough, we were good enough. Or, as a typical other way that human beings tend to do, is we can simply lower the standards of goodness so it's much more easily achievable. Paul says in Romans that God's standards of goodness have not been lowered, even if we want them to be. And there's a way to live with all, without all the pressure of trusting in our own attempts to measure up to God's standards. Chapter 1, verse 29, Paul speaks about how people have honestly become full of every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. And Paul says in verse 32 that although people know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of them who practice them. In a sense, Paul says, we lower God's standards to feel better about ourselves. Paul, then in chapter 2, speaks of God's judgment, where God will judge the world by God's righteous standards and will find us all guilty of not living up to what he calls his standards. Paul, in chapter 2, continues to challenge that those who think they have the strength and moral goodness in themselves to live up to God's law. Paul says, you who brag about the law, how good you keep it, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? And then he says to these people, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And he was speaking to the Jewish people who thought following God's law was their way to follow God. No, Paul reminds us, though, in chapter 3, verses 10 to 12, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. There is no one who does good, not even one. Paul, in doing this, isn't just trying to burst people's bubble of their goodness. But he's trying to show them that there's a new way to live in faith in Jesus Christ, where God's righteous standards are met. And the pressure is off our shoulders to bear whether we are good enough in life or not. This righteousness 
which is right standing in relationship with God, only comes, Paul says, to us through faith, which is that trust, that belief in Jesus. None of us is able to accomplish it on our own. As Paul says, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's glory, of course, is his perfection. I find the message paraphrase of these verses very helpful. He says, Eugene Peterson says, in using Paul's words, since we've compiled this long and sorry record as sinners, both us and them, and proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us, God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in, and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. Paul continues, he said, God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement. The day of atonement was when the, the day when the Israelites symbolically placed their sins on a lamb, and they sent it away out of the camp. Paul continues to say that Christ did this for those who have faith, and believing in Christ is demonstrate God's justice. In other words, God being God never lowered his standards of his perfection, but satisfied the call for justice by sacrificing Jesus as the consequence of sin. Paul uses the phrase demonstrate again in chapter 5, verse 8, to say, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How to really illustrate what Christ did in terms of justice and love for us. Um, this past week, we've heard the heartbreaking news about the nurse that is accused of killing eight people in Woodstock. Why would someone do such a thing? don't know. Um, but what this does is it creates fear, doesn't it, about the vulnerability of care facilities. And can easily take over our thinking compared to thinking about all those who faithfully serve and care for people in those facilities and do a good job. Well, we know in our hearts that there needs to be justice for the families involved in losing their loved ones so horribly. Would you be willing to sacrifice your loved one to satisfy the need for justice and love those in need of justice? I don't believe I would. I don't think I would be willing to give up my loved one so justice would be done. But this is what God did by sending Jesus. God had Jesus die for us. Christ's death satisfied the need for justice. That's why the reformers were reawakened to a need for faith, that belief and trust in what Jesus did not trust in ourselves. And it takes the pressure off. The pressure of us trying to be good enough, carrying that load of life, whether we had that piece of paper, did I have enough check boxes in mind to say, Jesus is my righteousness. What he did has enabled me to be good enough. As well, that goofy piece of paper promises eternal life. Paul came to say, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. What is that gift? What Jesus has accomplished for us. So we don't have to carry that burden. It is eternal life. So I pray we never become a church
that does this. But we live in faith in what Jesus has done for us and what he has accomplished. This was very important to Paul, that he actually ends his letter to Romans with these words. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my good news or gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles, non-Jewish people, might come to the obedience that comes through faith, belief, trust in Christ. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Martin Luther's realization of faith alone changed his life. He no longer had that pressure of trying to be good enough. He knew that Christ was good enough. And of course, it changed history as well. It started a movement of people who once again rediscovered that God in Christ demonstrated his justice and he demonstrated his love for us. Let us pray. Lord, we're very thankful that for the grace that is given to us by faith in you. That we don't have to trust in ourselves, but we can have faith that what you have done is enough. You have satisfied justice. You have also shown your love for us. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and who are struggling. And we pray for all of us as a church that we will be a church where people won't be carrying that burden of trying to earn salvation, but will find peace and faith in you. Help us and lead us and guide us as a church. We pray for those who couldn't be here this morning for various reasons. You know where they're at. Pray that you will help us to be able to bring your good news to them of your love and your satisfaction for justice in this world. Thank you for this day and lead and guide us as we pray. Amen.